Okay, time to talk a little about the respiratory pulmonary system for lab and some of the structures I think I'm going to want you to know and go over to be able to identify on some type of a chart somewhere that I put up. It's not the same as seeing a big model and trying to pick things out, but hey, it's the best we could do right now. Okay, so let's talk about some of these structures. Most of these we've already talked about before, you know, and in, in our in the lecture portion, if you've gone through the lecture portion, and the respiratory tree um, uh, begins up in the nose because the nose is basically a warming area. We talked about it humidifies, moisturizes, and so forth and so on, and as well as the mouth. This doesn't show the mouth; it shows the oral cavity in here, but it's closed. So the mouth and the nose are part of that upper respiratory tract that allow air to be able to enter in, okay? And then what happens at the back of the pharynx, we finally get to the back of the throat. And at the, and at the back of the throat, we have the larynx, okay? And that larynx is basically the thing that we're going to call the voice box. It's important because right above the larynx, larynx right here, there's a little flap of tissue. And that little flap of tissue is not listed on here, but it's called the epiglottis. And we talked about that in the in the um, in the lecture, okay, portion of the class, in the respiratory uh, uh, organs. What happens? It's a little flap. It's like a little little thumb like it's flat. And what happens is cartilage with a little muscle on the bottom of it and is covered with the mucous membrane, the same types of, of tissue that's in the back of the throat. And what happens is that little flap, when we swallow, if food's coming down the esophagus, that flap closes over the top of the trachea to close the trachea off. Uh, it's just above the area where we have the vocal cords, and I'll show you in, in a little bit when exactly where that is, okay? Uh, below that, once we get down in the trachea, okay, or down in, the, in, in this area right here, until we get to the crina. The crina is where that area of the trachea will die, bifurcate. I think that's an important uh, play, uh, point to notice, uh, simply because what happens is that's, again, where we have our cough centers. So all the nerves that will uh, provide a uh, cough reflex are are basically in that carina. And from that point, we go to a bronchus that goes to the to the right lung and a bronchus that goes to the left lung, okay? Now, again, when we look at, this is called the right, right, right main stem bronchus that goes to the right lung and a left main stem bronchus that goes to the left lung, okay? It's the main two. Then what happens is once I get there, I know that what happens when I start to look at the lung, I have a lobe here, I have a lobe here, and I have a lobe here. So this is my right upper lobe. This is This one right here is my right upper lobe. This is my right middle lobe, and this is my right lower lobe. And that uh, left lung is divided by a left upper lobe and a left lower lobe. Now, I'll show you what they look like when we look at them from the side because they look a little bit different. One other area about the lung that I want to show you is this area right here. Okay, let me do it in a, do it in a purple. And see if the purple shows. There's the purple. Okay, and right here is where the heart's going to be sitting in there. Okay, so the heart's going to be sitting right in this area. This little area, let me get rid of it for just a second. This little area right here is called the cardiac, you probably won't be able to read this, cardiac notch, N-O-T-C-H, okay, N-O-T-C-H. And that's a little area that's a cutout, okay. Uh, and there's a little, actually there's a, there's a little portion of the lung that comes over here, which used to call the lingual area, because lingual means tongue that sticks over there, but that's not important. Down here, we know we have the diaphragm, which is important because we talked about that in, in the in the respiratory movements and, and how I breathe, because the diaphragm goes down as well as the, the, the ribs go up and out because of the external intercostals. Uh, also, I think, again, this shows here the membrane. There's a membrane that covers the lung and the inside of the chest wall, and that's my parietal pleura. That would be my parietal pleura. And then the, the membrane, as it flips back on itself, that covers the lung itself is called the visceral pleura. Now, these are things that we should know that we've talked about before, okay? We'll talk a little bit more about the alveoli when we get a little bit further down and in, in the road. Now, this is just, a, I, I sort of like this for a couple of reasons, okay? Simply because what, what we talk about is it actually gives me, it, it says upper respiratory system and stuff like that, and I, I'm not so sure that this is a good way to, 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 uh, to divide that, because I'm not really talking about the lower respiratory system until I finally get down towards the bronchi and stuff like that. So a lot of people when they have an upper respiratory system problem, it's in the nose and the throat, and maybe some of the trunk, tra trachea, okay? And even sometimes a little bit in the bronchi, when I finally get down into the lungs, that's what we consider most of our lower respiratory system. And basically, this uh, this just shows, um, so I wouldn't pay too much attention to the upper and the lower 
up in there. But I think I'd look, it might be not a bad idea just to help you get prepared for the lecture portion to look what these what these do. Here it talks about the epiglass, how it covers the larynx during swallowing, talks about the larynx and stuff like that, uh, pr produces voice, uh, prevents food and drink from entering the lower respiratory system. So they're basically looking at the at the at the area of the epiglottis um, and, and, and the larynx is being lower, okay? When we talk about infections, uh, probably the lower respiratory system when we finally get down to the bronchioles and the alveoli, more of the um, respiratory portion of the lungs. But anyway, that's beside the point. I think it's what I, what I put this on here for is that you could look at some of these uh, definitions of what these things do, sort of like a, just a review in regards to what you would see in your... Um, uh, in your uh, lecture class, okay? Uh, this is, I think, really important, okay? And we talked about this in, uh, in the lecture. We have what's called the conducting zone. And the conducting zone is basically the airways that all they are is a passageway. They conduct the air from the outside down to where the, the magic happens, where the gases get exchanged. So we're talking about the trachea being part of the conducting zone, the bronchi, all the other bronchioles and stuff like that, all the way till I get down to the area down here where I get to the terminal or the area of the respiratory bronchioles. Then this is called the respiratory zone because this is the area down here that really makes the difference. That's where we have the, the gas exchange. Um, to be truthful, if you look at if you look at here, you know uh, the, the the size. The, 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 there's a, it's like I talked about maybe five six liters worth of air that you'd fill inside the lung, and all that's filling all these little small little bubbles, and the little bubbles are called alveoli. Okay, alveolus would be singular, alveoli would be would be plural. Okay, and all these little bubbles are where the gas exchange occurs, and that's the respiratory area because that's where gas exchange is occurring within the lungs. But let's talk a little bit more about structure. Let's look again at the upper portion of that airway, okay? Um, this is just showing me the, the, the nasal cavity in here, the oral cavity in here, and then all the way down through the back of the throat. So this area right here would be the nasopharynx, okay? And I'll put NP, NP. This area right here is the oropharynx, OP, and this area down here is the laryngo pharynx. And I think that's really sort of important to know. If you look inside the nasal uh, the, the nasal the nasal pharynx back in here, a couple structures in the in the nasal cavity that we do see. We had talked about in the uh, uh, in, in the lecture, these things called turbinates, okay? And the turbinates are these uh, shelves that are inside the nose. If you look inside the nose, if you, it's hard to see in your own nose. You have to use somebody else's and borrow it, okay? What happens is if you look inside there, you see these shelves. There's an inferior turbinate, a middle turbinate, and an upper turbinate, okay? And basically what they do is they increase the surface area inside the nose to improve the level of moisturization and humidification and trapping of all, all kinds of other garbage that's in there. On the back of the nose, we saw that opening we talked about in the lecture from the area for the area for the for the uh, eustachian tube and the eustachian tube is that tube that goes to the middle ear to equalize pressure in front of and behind uh, the eardrum uh, right down in this area it doesn't show it really well on here. here's a frontal sinus up there in the skull here's a sphenoid sinus in, in there there's also the maxillary sinus but we can't see it because it's inside the bone but right here there's a little bubble okay just below that middle turbinate and that's where not all but most of the sinuses empty into. So all the mucus that's produced in the sinuses come through a little canal. They will empty right in this area just below the middle turbinate. Okay, and that's what we see. That's the that's the most important thing that we see. Also, back in here we have the nasal lacrimal duct that comes from the eye that drains the eye. So that's a little bit about that. Let's go down though. Okay, and let's get down in the area of the oral pharynx. Okay, so now we're here in the oral pharynx. In the oral pharynx, first of all, I probably should mention even before I get there. Back in here is where the adenoids are, okay? And those are called my pharyngeal tonsils. They're right, right at the junction between the nasopharynx up here and the oropharynx down here. So the adenoids would be sitting right back in there. But what we also find uh, in here, okay, <clears throat> that's, that's sitting uh, here are my palatine tonsils my palatine tonsils. And you can see, well, actually, it says here the adenoids are up in here, but actually they're, they're, they're more in here on the back wall. Hard to see. You can't really see much up in there. See, so what they do is they'll actually block off that way. My palatine tonsils are sitting back here at the back of the throat, okay? 
and those are the ones we see when we look inside and we also have our lingual tonsils and the lingual tonsils will be at the back of the tongue right in that area okay so that's what we see in the oral pharynx that would be the oral cavity here's the tongue right here and that's pretty much what what we have in that area of the oral pharynx and the nasopharynx okay let's go down one level let's get rid of this stuff and this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. Let's get the oral pharynx out of there, okay? We get down to the laryngopharynx, okay? Uh, there's a bone down here, which is called the hyoid bone. that sits right here. And it's interesting bone, as we've talked about before, because it doesn't articulate with any other um, uh, any other any other bone at all it, it's suspended by muscles that actually that are from that come from below the tongue and that go down to the to lower in the neck and it sits down in there and right behind the right behind the uh, area of the hyoid okay you're gonna find that flap of tissue and that flap of tissue is this thing right here okay and that little flap of tissue okay is 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 called the epiglottis okay now this epiglottis is ligament or an excuse me, excuse me, nothing. Is cartilage is covered by mucous membrane has some muscles. When we eat, that epiglottis is going to close over the top of the opening of the trachea right here to prevent food from coming down into the trachea. So food's going to go down the posterior, and this back in here would be the esophagus. Okay, this so esophagus is going to be back in there. So basically, that's what we see. That's that. That's the epiglottis. It uh, uh, sometimes in kids they get what's called an epiglottitis. It's usually because of a, a bacteria called uh, Haemophilus influenza. And sometimes the epiglottis gets really big, which actually gets so big it actually blocks off the airway, and pe and kids could die. It happens rapidly when that happens, but it doesn't. Luckily, it doesn't happen all that often. And a lot. And nowadays, what happens is they're actually giving immunizations against Haemophilus influenza to prevent that from causing a problem okay so so that's the epiglottis that will cost it will, it will close off the trachea so food doesn't get down there finally when I get down inside there to divide the trachea from the the the, or the, the laryngo to divide the trachea from the laryngopharynx back in here this is the area called the glottis okay now the glottis is the gap between the vocal cords and I'll show you a picture of that in just a second so now we know we have our adenoids up in here we have our our, our, uh, our palatine tonsils here, our lingual tonsils uh, back in here, epiglottis is sitting right here, uh, turbinates are up in here, uh, eustachian tube right there, uh, let's see what else. Those are the major things. And if you follow these, you'll probably be pretty good in regards to being able to identify everything on any kind of lab practice we'd have. Now, this is looking down inside the, inside the throat, okay? Uh, then I look down inside, this is anterior. Well, let me do some different colors. It's easier to see. This would be, come on. This would be anterior. This would be posterior. So this is anterior and this is posterior. So just the opposite on that. These are the vocal cords. This is what the vocal cords would be. Okay. And right here, anteriorly, would be that area of the epiglottis. It sits right there. If this is the vocal cords, the epiglottis is sitting right here. This epiglottis is sitting up in here in front. So it's going to come over the top. It flaps down over the top of that. Okay. Now this this area is called the glottis. Now the glottis is the vocal cords we talked about. Okay. And actually here you can actually see down the trachea. So that with this, this will be looking right down inside the trachea. If I'm looking down there, epiglottis in the front. The vocal cords come together in the front. They, they're narrow in the front. They're wider in the back. However, the vocal cords will change in location and distance apart. And that changes the speech characteristics and stuff like that. Also, when we hold our breath a lot of times, what's going to happen is these vocal cords will actually snap shut. Okay? They snap shut. Now, what happens is if I look at the, the vocal cords, okay, uh, uh, we have next to them right in here. Let me get rid of all this so you can see it. Okay? If I, I have it, and let me get rid of this up in here too while we're, while we're at it. Okay, so the, remember the epiglottis is anterior to the to the area of the of the vocal cords. If I look down in here, there's this band of mem it's a membrane that sits right here and right here. These are called the vestibular folds. Okay, the vestibular fold, and that vestibular fold is basically a membrane that covers everything lateral to the vocal cords on both sides. So if the, if the vocal cords come together in the middle, that whole area is covered. Because the, because that brings those lateral fold, those, those vestibular folds over. So the vocal cords would be here. The vestibular folds would be all the way through, because these vestibular folds attach to the side. Okay. This here, the, by the way, this is called the rima glottis. Rima, R-I-M-A, glottis. If you ever see something like that, 
um, but that's what we see in there uh, if you look here in this upper picture or in the right picture on the right okay if 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 this is the epiglottis right here okay and this is the glottis. here's the back of the tongue this is the back of the tongue back in here and this is where the uh, uh, lingual tonsils would be in there would be sitting inside there so that's the root of the tongue with those lingual tonsils at the back of the tongue they sit right back in that little fold there's a little gutter that goes all the way around here okay a little gutter that goes all the way around the outside of the glottis and this area in here is basically a bunch of um, uh, pieces of cartilage they're attached to muscle and those muscles will cause the cartilage to move and when it does it causes the vocal cords to change in their location okay so that's how we how we change our speech by these little muscles moving moving the vocal cords closer moving them farther apart tightening them loosening them and it changes the pitch and everything in the speech so i think that this is what we see when we look down inside the area of the inside that the, the throat what they do is they do a laryngoscopy laryngoscopy would be looking inside nowadays a lot of times they just do fiber optic they just take a fiber optic scope put it down there and they could see that really well years ago what we used to do is you ever see those old pictures of the old doctor doctor films they used to have that little mirror that they used to wear on their head it used to be up in here well the mirror had a little hole in the center and that mirror was actually mildly concave what we used to do is we used to take and flip the mirror over our eye and look through the hole in the center we stick a light behind the patient's head, that light would shine at the mirror, and because it was concave, it would focus right down. Well, we'd see the back of the throat, okay? We'd see at the at the back of the throat. I, I had to see downwards. So we used to use a little mirror, like the dentist would use, those little angle mirrors. The mirror, there's a mirror right here. It comes on a, on a, on a, on a, on a little thing like that, and it bent like that. So you take that mirror and stick it against the soft palate and shine that mirror so, the, so you'd be looking in that mirror and looking downwards. You'd bounce the light source off there on the mirror and down, and you'd be able to see the area of the vocal cords. It was a it was tough, okay? But that's how we used to be able to see the vocal cords. Nowadays, they just use fiber optics to look at that, okay? Next step down, once I get past that, one thing I should mention in this, in this image right here is this area right here, okay, is the area of the larynx, okay? And the larynx is the voice box. The vocal cords are inside here. They're about this level inside the larynx, right about this level, right where this, this part up in here, the larger part in here that looks like a little butterfly, okay? The area that looks like a butterfly right here, okay, is called the thyroid cartilage. Thyroid. You can't see that. I don't know why this is right. Thyroid cartilage, okay? Thyroid gland actually sits right down in here. The thyroid gland will be sitting right in this area. That's the thyroid cartilage. Below the thyroid cartilage is a little gap, okay? And if you look, there's a little, there's a little area right here between that. And then there's another piece of cartilage that goes right below that. That smaller piece of cartilage underneath this one that goes into there is called the uh, 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 cricoid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage. If you feel your throat, you can actually feel the thyroid cartilage, then you'll feel a little gap. And right below it, you feel another cartilage, which is actually, uh, it's, 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 it's more like, it's more ring-like, okay? And between that is called the crico thyroid membrane, cricothyroid membrane, right between the two. A lot of times when they used to do like, uh, if someone would have something blocked in their vocal cords that would cause them to choke because of a piece of food that's caught there, when people uh, get choked, a lot of times that piece of food that's too big gets caught in the area of the vocal cords, okay? And therefore it blocks the airway. So a lot of times what they used to do is they used to do a cricothyroid stick where they take a large needle or something that was large and poke it through the neck and stick it right through that membrane right in here and that would be below the level of the vocal cords and therefore they'd start to breathe through that little hole okay so that's that but the thyroid uh, gland sits right down here around the, the, the trachea like that okay so now I know that this is the larynx and that that glottis is right about this level in the larynx that's the cricothyroid membrane that's the cricoid cartilage right there and basically that's what I see here up, up there now what happens is once I go past the area of the or the cricoid cartilage, again, that cricoid cartilage right here, right here, I get down to the main portion of the trachea, okay? Now, this is interesting. All those little white lines that you see on the trachea, 
you could actually feel those. If you take your fingers, you could feel those little lines. And what those little lines are is their cartilage rings. And the cartilage rings are there to keep the trachea open so the trachea doesn't collapse. The esophagus, if there's no food in the esophagus, which behind the trachea is flat, it's closed. But what happens is, and then when we eat, it opens up. But the trachea always has to stay open because we're always passing air. These cartilages, cartilage doesn't go all the way around. If I'm looking at the trachea like this, okay, and this is posterior and this is anterior, those, those cartilage, the cartilage actually goes around about like this, about this far, okay? So the cartilage comes around the trachea this way, and the back portion, back in here, is covered by muscle, which the esophagus sits right back inside behind there, okay? It's attached to the back side of the trachea back there, okay? But those car the cartilage keeps the, the, the trachea open, okay? Once I get down to the level of that second rib where that sternal angle is, where the manubrium of the sternum meets the body, I get to this point right here, okay? And we know before that's called the carina. That's where we divide into a, what's called the right main stem bronchus and the left main stem bronchus. Sometimes primary, it would be used as well, but I, we always used to use main stem. The right main stem bronchus I talked about in the, in the lecture is a little bit more vertical and it's a little bit larger in size. The right main, excuse, the, the right main stem bron bronchus is more vertical and larger. The left main stem bronchus is smaller and more horizontal. Okay, because again, this is going to two lobes. This is going to three lobes. Okay, if I'm looking at my 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 right main stem bronchus, it has to go to three lobes, where my left main stem bronchus is going to two lobes. And what happens is once I get to the lung, once the the bronchus gets to the lung, the lung was like this. Okay, it divides. One part of it's going to go this. That's a secondary bronchus. It's going to go to the upper lobe. I'm going to have a lobe that's going to come down here to the middle lobe, and then or a, a branch is going to go down, a bronchus that's going down the middle lobe, and a bronchus that's going to go down to the lower lobe. And those are called secondary bronchi. Secondary bronchi, because what they're doing is, they're, is, they, is each lobe needs another large airway that goes to that particular lobe. So I have my main stem bronchus that goes to the right lung and the left lung. I have my secondary bronchus which goes to the lobe. Okay upper lobe, middle lobe, and lower lobe on the right, upper lobe, and lower lobe on the left. And then what happens, I get to what I call ter tertiary bronchi. And what these do is they start to branch off into smaller branches all through off that secondary bronchus. And they even get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, okay? And what they do is they go to what are called bronchopulmonary segments. If you're a pulmonary therapy person, what happens, they have all these bronchopulmonary segments that are all over and they could, there's like four in the upper lobe on the right and you know all kinds of difference. So there's a, a bunch of them. So they have to know where all those go. The interesting thing I wanna point out though in this image is you see the cartilage, you see the cartilage, okay? You see the cartilage, See the cartilage going across all these things. It keeps on going all the way through, through most of these secondary and even down a little bit lower branches of, of the bronchi. That keeps the airways open. Now, if we took a lung and cut it with a knife, if I took a lung and took it on the table and you cut it with a knife, the knife, it would actually have a grizzly feeling <clears throat> when they cut it with a knife. It's full of all these little air sacs, which we'll talk about in a second. But when you're cutting the, 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 the lung, you know, with the with the knife, it feels grisly. And the reason why it feels grisly is all these little airways are still lined with cartilage. Now, once I get down past the trachea, the cartilage goes all the way around. Instead of going two thirds of the way around, it can go all the way around the bronchi. It holds those bronchi, the bronchioles, bronchi, bronchi open. Okay, so as a result, the cartilage down here starts to go all the way around the, the, the bronchi, all the way down. And I don't start losing it until I get to my smaller airways, way down when I start to lose some of the uh, connective tissue wall of the bronchus and start to develop more muscle. Okay, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So uh, that's why you get that gritty feeling because you're cutting through that cartilage as you, as you go through. And also, if you take a lung and you cut through it and you hold it up, you'll see all these holes that are in there and those holes aren't the air aren't aren't the little alveolus the little air sacs but those are the actual airways that are held open because they're held open because the airways the bronchus are surrounded by pieces or rings of cartilage okay so that's what we see in regards to the the, the airways i go from my trachea to my main stem or primary bronchus right and left and then my primary bronchus divides into a secondary bronchus that goes to each lobe upper middle lower 
upper and lower, and then it goes to uh, tertiary, which gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. You know, uh, fourth degree, fifth degree type bronchus, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Still with cartilage, but now the cartilage goes all the way around until I finally get down and start to lose the cartilage and replace it with muscle. And I'll talk about why that muscle is important in just a second, okay? So this is looking at the lung from the front, okay? So if I'm looking at the lung from the front, here's the upper lobe right here. So here's my right upper lobe. Here's my right middle lobe. Here's my right lower lobe, okay? Here's my left upper lobe and left lower lobe. This is called the oblique fissure. Guess why? Because it's oblique, okay? And here's the oblique fissure on this side, and this is called the horizontal fissure. You know why they call it the horizontal fissure? Because it's horizontal, okay? So basically, the horizontal fissure divides the upper lobe from the middle lobe where that oblique fissure divides the upper lobe from the lower lobe and the, and the middle lobe and a little bit of the posterior aspect of the upper lobe from the lower lobe on the right side. So that's looking at the lung from the front, okay? And we look very similar in the back, okay? Um, although it's not quite exactly the same in the back. Um, the, these, the, the oblique um, fissure on both sides is a little bit angled. Um, it goes a little bit higher posteriorly and lower anteriorly, okay? But if I take the lung now and look at it from the inside, now what I've done is taken the lungs this way and I've opened them up so I could actually, so here's the lung here, I could actually see the inside of the lungs next to the heart. Oh, I wanted to go back. That way I forgot to show that cardiac notch, okay? You can see the cardiac notch that was right here. And it goes on. Make sure you go back and look at that, at the, you know, take it back a little bit until you go to the last slide. And you can actually see where that cardiac notch is in the area of the left lung. And that's what you see right here. Here's the actually the shadow where most of the, most of the heart would be sitting in. This area right here is actually a groove for guess what? The aorta, because the aorta goes swings to the left, okay? The what, reason why I pointed this out is the bottom of the lung, okay, and it's on the, on the last slide, the bottom of the lung is called the base, called the base. And the top of the lung where it comes to a point is called the apex, okay? So I have my base down here and my apex up there. This area right here is critical as well, okay? This area right here is called the hilum. It's called the hilum. And the hilum, the hilum is the area where everything enters or leaves the lung through that one area, okay? The hilum, everything goes and enters or leaves the lung through that through that one area, okay? Uh, the, the, the bronchi enter through there, the pulmonary arteries, the pulmonary veins, they're all going in and out through that area. You can't have them come through the outside. Well, first of all, the heart's right there. You might as well keep it close, okay? That's the first thing. And the trachea, you might as well keep it close. Second thing is I can't have things on the outside because what happens is as the lung, as the chest is expanding like we talked about in the mechanical process the, the, in ventilation that what happens is that the lungs expand with it so they have to slide against the wall they're not stuck to the wall but they're like say almost like suctioned to the wall of the chest so that moves out what we'd find in the surface of the lung all over would be what visceral pleura we see visceral pleura that's covering all that covering down here coming down here the whole lung will be covered with visceral pleura and then what happened this is sort of interesting okay and, I, and let me just erase whoops I gotta erase let me just erase this stuff here. I'll show you something that's, I think, really cool. Okay. So you're learning all these cool things in, in anatomy and physiology. I guess if you're a nerd, they're cool, I guess. Okay. But anyway, so, I, you know, yeah, guilty. Anyway, so what happens is if we look down here, you get, I see how, it, I see how, you see there's like a line. See, there's like, like let me put, see, I could, there's like a line that goes around the whole hilum. Okay, and it comes down here, comes out here. That's the area where that where the visceral pleura folds back, and it's going to cover the inside, the the cover the, the the wall of the mediastinum, and fall back, and it'll cover the diaphragm down here as well as the um, the inside of the chest wall. Okay, now this area right here, okay. You can see it right here. It's called the pulmonary ligament. It's really not a ligament, like a ligament in a knee or something like that. But basically, it's an area where that uh, pleura is together, and that actually holds the lung a little bit. It, it, it sort of tethers it a little bit to the mediastinal wall, which is actually a good thing, so it doesn't go and doesn't move. I mentioned before um, that what happens if I look at the at the fissures. Okay, so this and, and this on my left lung, this would be anterior, and this would be posterior. I mentioned when I look at the lung from the side that 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 oblique fissure actually is higher in the back lower in the front same thing here so this would be uh, this would be uh, anterior and this would be posterior and you see how it's higher in the in the back lower in the front and here would be that 
horizontal fissure sitting right there. Sometimes radiographically, we're able to actually see that horizontal fissure if we catch it just right on a, on a particular uh, uh, plane of the X-ray. But that's looking at, at the at the medial aspect of of the uh, of the lung and uh, sort of in the area where we're actually looking at. Uh, we've taken the taken the hearts like are the, the lungs this way and moved it out this way so I could see the inside aspect and you can see where the pleura is on there where the fissures go that way and stuff like that there. This is just also looking at the area of the lungs, looking at what we see like you'd see on an X-ray and basically pretty much what we showed before. Here's my left upper lobe, left lower lobe, left upper lobe. Oops. My left upper lobe, left lower lobe, right upper lobe, right middle lobe, right lower lobe. And you can see from behind where these fissures are, how they actually are higher in the back and lower in the front. Those are, that's the oblique fissure. Lower in the front, higher in the back. And this is looking from the side. You can actually see how that oblique fissure comes this way. Here's the horizontal fissure there. I just thought that sort of pointed out really well in, in regards to seeing how, how that looks, okay? Uh, again, if you look right here, okay, and this is sort of, uh, I, I like that, I just noticed it too. See right here? That's that sternal angle. Let me put it in red so you'll see it even better. That's the sternal angle. That's where the manubrium meets the sternal body, okay? Maneuver meets the sternal body. You can see it right there, and that's the area where the trachea is going to bifurcate. It's going to come down, and it's going to go to the right, to the, at, at, at my, for my right main stem bronchus and my left main stem bronchus. And where does it do that? X marks the spot, right about in there. Okay, that's where that's going to happen. So that just shows a little bit about what we see in regards to uh, uh, where it would be on a human as to where we see these these landmarks would be. Okay. Um, if you haven't noticed that when you went to the doc uh, in lab, this is the thing. I, this, this is the thing I really miss. Okay, in lab I had a bunch of other things. I had stethoscopes. We could actually listen to lungs and listen to hearts, so I could hear the heart sounds. And we didn't we didn't mention this too much with the heart sounds. But when you hear the heart sounds, it's sort of like a lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. The first lub is actually the closure of the tricuspid and the mitral valve. The sec the second dub, lub, or second dub, the lub dub. The second is actually the closure of the pulmonary and the aortic valve. Okay, so that's what you actually hear. You're actually hearing the blood going back against those valves as they snap shut. And you're hearing those in those two heart sounds. It's called an S1, which is the first sound, S sound one, S1, which is the closure of the tricuspid and the mitral valve, and S2, sound two, is where the closure of the a of the aortic and the pulmonary valve. And you can hear them at different spots on the chest. In fact, if I take, if you have a stethoscope at home, try this, okay? I don't know if you do, if you don't. And if, and if not, when we get back into try C, if you see me in the hall and I'm walking around with a stethoscope, I'll let you listen. If I listen to the heart up in, let me put the thing down here. If I listen to the heart up here near the top, okay? At the top of the sternum on both sides, the, the, the heart sounds gonna sound like this, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. The second sound is much uh, much more abrupt and louder. And the reason why it is, is you're sitting right over the top of the aortic and the pulmonary valve, okay? If I go down here or over here, it's lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. The first sound's more prominent because you're sitting over the area of the tricuspid and mitral valve, bicuspid mitral valve. So anyway, that's just a little bit about uh, about heart sounds. But um, it was nice that in lab we, we were also able to to look at um, uh, also looking and listen to the lung sounds. You can hear breath sounds and different type of breath sounds or abnormal breath sounds that there might be. So, but unfortunately we can't do that now. Now let's get down to the nitty gritty here. What we've talked about so far is the conducting portion. Everything we've talked about thus far through all those bronchi, all that stuff, has to do with the conducting system. There's no gas exchange occurring there at all, none whatsoever, zero, nada, absent, uh, never, okay? It doesn't happen there. All it is is a conducting area. It's about 150 to maybe 175 uh, milliliters of airspace. That's all it is. But what happens if I take that lung, even though you see all these little bronchi that are inside the lung if you cut it, what happens what you don't see is you see, and it looks like the rest of the tissue, but what you don't see, if you looked at it microscop microscopically, is you'd see all these little areas that look like little bunches of grapes all over, okay? Little bunches of grapes all over, okay? And these are called the alveoli, okay? These are called the alveoli, and these alveoli are the areas where the gas is exchanged. What happens, I finally get down to what's called the, the terminal bronchial and the respiratory bronchial, 
right down in here. Respiratory bronchial would be in here. Terminal bronchial, I've made that transition where I've lost the cartilage and I'm starting to get a little bit more muscular um, wall of, of the airways. I get down to the respiratory bronchial and the walls are very muscular. There's muscular muscle around the walls of the respiratory bronchial. And we talked about this in the in the uh, lecture portion of the of the video is that what happens is the, the the smooth muscle that's in walls of the respiratory bronchial, they could either relax and, and open up the bronchial, which means more air gets into that cluster of little uh, bubbles called the alveolus, or they could contract and decrease the amount of air that gets in there for gas exchange. Um, when we're sleeping at night, if you wait, if you have a stethoscope, put a stethoscope by your bed, and the first thing you get up in, in the morning before you take a deep breath, take that stethoscope and stick it down by the lower portion, by the base of your lungs, and take a deep breath, and you hear all these crackles and pops. Because a lot of these, when they're not used, they sort of collapse down and they don't do much because we aerate mostly the upper portion of my lungs anyway. We aerate that a lot better than the lower portion. Okay. So what happens is we finally get down to these areas of the, of the, of the alveolus. Now, the important thing about the alveolus is I have a capillary network in there. We have the arterial portion of the capillary, the arterial side of the capillary network and the venous side. From the venous side, I'm bringing in all the waste, the carbon dioxide and the deoxygenated blood. And then what happens, I take that carbon dioxide and take it out of the capillary, go across the wall of the membrane, the membrane of the alveolus, and I get inside the alveolar sac. And eventually it's going to go out through the respiratory bronchial, through the terminal bronchial, and back all the way up to finally get to the trachea and out the mouth to be, out, to be able to be exhaled. Okay, But also what happens is when I have the, my on the on the on the uh, it, I'm, the air that's inside those alveoli now will come out and will fill up the capillaries as they're leaving that area. Therefore, they're giving the oxygen that's in the air or in the atmosphere, put it back in the capillary. I've taken the carbon dioxide out of the blood, put in the alveolus, and got rid of it. But the uh, oxygen that's in the air now gets into the capillaries, and therefore it becomes uh, becomes full of oxygen. Okay, I can't. It's not for some reason not writing very well today. It's full of oxygen. Let's see if I can try a different one. Oh, it's not working at all. Full of oxygen, and as a result, uh, at that point, um, that's where I get the oxygenation of the blood. Okay, and that's in the alveolus. So I think I would know. Think about the about the terminal bronchioles and how they have smooth muscle in there instead of cartilage, and the respiratory bronchioles, which are very reactive. When people have asthma, a lot of times what they'll do with the asthma is uh, uh, they get a bronchodilator. Okay, and the bronchodilator will allow, will relax the smooth muscles of the terminal bronchioles and the respiratory bronchioles to open them up so they can get the air in, or they can actually get air out. Because asthma is more of an air trapping problem where actually we, we trap air inside the alveolus, it's hard to get out. But the lung is filled with these small little air bags, little air sacs all over, probably about five liters worth or more. They're sitting inside the, so that's where the gas exchange occurs. Not in anything else, but these small little microscopic things where all that change occurs. Now, inside those little um, I mentioned this in the in the uh, in the lecture portion inside the alveolus there are special cells and these set these are they're called pneumocytes type 2 and these pneumocytes type 2 secrete a fluid called surfactant and the surfactant lines the inside the alveolus and that provides attention to keep the alveolus open that's like soap bubbles soap bubbles stay open because they're surfactant that that soap and as a result uh, the same I need that inside there when they have a premature baby if the lungs aren't developed these, these pneumocytes type 2 that make the surfactant don't work. They're not functional, okay? And they're not making that material. And when they don't make that material, the alveoli collapse. And that's why they have to stick a baby who's premature, very premature, and the lungs aren't, aren't, aren't mature enough. They have to stick them on a ventilator to be able to open up those alveoli, okay? So that pretty much covers most of the structures that I think you need to know, okay? And I think that uh, if you follow all the legends and all these, you'll probably do really well. So in summary, the pulmonary system is a lot less complicated um, in regards to structures than the cardiovascular system. You know, we, we it's, it's just a, it's just a, it's very simple in the way that the physiology works in regards to how I breathe. It's not nearly as complicated as the cardiovascular system, but it's, it's equally as important because the only way I could get the oxygen to the blood is through the air I breathe and the exchange of that at the alveolar level. How does it get the alveolar level? 
through the nose and the mouth and all the structures we're talking about down past the, the epiglottis at the back of the tongue. In fact, if you if you go and you're really adventurous, if you take your finger and stick it down on your tongue and say, ah, sometimes you'll see that little epiglottis peeking over the top waving at you, okay? But, I mean, that's until the vomit starts to come up, okay? And then all of a sudden you lose it. You can't see it. So you might not want to do it if you have a really bad gag reflex. What happens is once I get that air past the area of the epiglottis and it is allowed to go down inside the trachea, gets down the trachea, gets down to that area of the sternal angle, at the manubrium uh, sternal body junction, it divides into a right main stem bronchus, left main stem bronchus. Secondary bronchus then goes into each lobe on each side, and they have tertiary bronchi, which gets smaller and smaller and smaller. For fourth degree, fifth degree of bronchi, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Those bronchi are bron 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 bronchi are held open by cartilage that goes around them, except for the trachea, it only goes around two thirds of the way around it. And until I finally get down to the bronchioles, the bronchioles, they lose the cartilage, they gain muscle, and that muscle allows them to open or close to allow air to go in or air to come out. That's about it. And then all that gas exchange, like we talked about, uh, occurs at the alveolus, which is where the magic happens and why we're still alive today, because these alveolus are working. Again, certain conditions such as um, emphysema, they lose that structure and the number of effective alveoli are gone because they're they're replaced. Uh, there's a lot of scar in the lung as well as a lot of these they, they just sort of like go to pot and you have large air areas you know air filled areas called blebs that don't do anything. There's no gas exchange. So people with emphysema effective effectively lose a significant portion of the lung that they're able to, to, to breathe with. Now, we could actually live with one lung. We could usually work, we love, live uh, at least uh, tolerably with one lung. Okay. My dad had a, um, a silicosis. They thought it was a, a, a cancer, but they took it out. It was a silicosis, which was lucky. It wasn't you know, malignant. Um, it was basically from uh, silica dust or sand dust that he had from an old job a long time ago. And um, uh, so he had, a, he had a lobe removed, and he did fine after that. I mean, there was never a problem. Other things were more problems than the, actually the, the lung. So anyway, hopefully you're able to see these things. And again, I'd look at the legends and look at the pictures and give you a better idea about the structures that might show up on lab practical, which will be, by the way, the fourth and last lab practical before we get to the final. Okay. And the final, there's no lab practical for the final. So you only have one lab practical after the one for um, uh, the joints and muscles, okay, which I'll do at the end, of, you know, so those that's coming up, okay, I'll talk to you soon, and uh, be good, be safe, be healthy, and we'll talk to you.